Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. We're delighted you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, president of City Club. Our program today is entitled Trading Places, the benefits of having a port in your community. Our speaker is Bill Wyatt, executive director of the Port of Portland. For the benefit of our radio and television audiences, please turn off your cell phones, Blackberries, and other electronic devices. First, a few announcements. Join us next Friday for a discussion with Michael Schellenberger. Michael is the author of Breakthrough, From the Death of Environmentalism to the Politics of Possibility. He's going to talk about and present his case for moving from pollution control to a clean energy economy. In about four hours, City Club members and their guests are invital, invited to a special Final Friday open house at the City Club Commons. The gathering's from 4.30 to 6, and this presents a great opportunity for you to learn more about the Oregon ballot measures. The City Club members who are on the research committees for ballot measure 49 and 50 will be there to uh, stimulate discussion, and the, the event is free open to the public, and no RSVPs are required. During the month of October, we will have the Citizens Read Book Group. They will read Community and the Politics of Place by Dennis Chemis, or Daniel Chemis, I'm sorry. In his book, the former mayor of Missoula, Montana, attempts to trace back the spirit of civic involvement, both from our founding fathers to today's community meetings and he promotes the benefits of grassroots, community-based solutions to societal problems. Sounds like he might even be a fan of City Club. Citizens Read will meet on Monday, October 29th at 7 o'clock p.m., and if you'd like to attend, please uh, RSVT, RSVP with Kim at the City Club office. Join me in welcoming a new City Club member, um, Corey Rivard, who works for FlexPrint Inc. is a new member of City Club. Corey, welcome. <laughs> We're fortunate to have terrific corporate sponsors for this program, and this quarter's sponsors are Girding Edlin Development and the law firm of Baron Liebman LLP. Thank you for your support. Transportation, the environment and sustainability, commerce, land use. Now these are some of the most favorite topics of City Club Friday Forum audiences and today we're fortunate to have a speaker who's going to address all of them. Astoria, Oregon native Bill Wyatt is the executive director of the Port of Portland. The port was founded in 1891 and now operates four marine terminals three general aviation airports, and of course, Portland International Airport. Last year, PDX handled over 14 million passengers, which was a record-breaking year. The port has 800 employees and annual revenues approaching 240 million. Many would also be surprised that our port is the world's third largest grain export center and the U.S. port with the largest wheat exports. In a very competitive environment, the port needs to meet many challenges both to sustain and expand our region's share of the global economy. It's also easy for us as Oregonians to take the Port of Portland for granted. Unlike Seattle's working waterfront where views of huge barges and container ships are right at the city's doorstep, Portland's working harbor goes largely unnoticed. It's 104 miles up the Columbia River and it can't accommodate the huge new container ships. However, according to Oregon Business Magazine, low profile Northwest ports are being marketed as an asset to shippers who are now looking to the Port of Portland and the Port of Vancouver to avoid the congestion of Southern California. 
Last year, the port increased its traffic by 33 percent, and Portland's working harbor continues to be a critical player in the economic health of our region. In fact, about 30,000 people are employed on the Portland waterfront. Under Bill's leadership, the port has also adopted a series of ambitious environmental objectives, and these focus on air and water quality, energy conservation, recycling, and natural resource management. Funding's also an ongoing issue. Can the port create financing mechanisms to help it build the infrastructure it needs to compete? Bill Wyatt has been executive director of the port since October of 2001. And prior to that, he served as chief of staff for former Governor John Kitzhaber for seven years. Our speaker also has a solid business background. He worked for six years as president of the Oregon Business Council and five years as executive director of the Association of Portland Progress. Politics runs in the Wyatt family. In fact, I am extremely proud to say that Wendell Wyatt, Bill's dad, who served as an Oregon congressman for 10 years, is in our audience at this front table. <laughs> Bill also served as a state representative from 1974 to 1977. He's also been a member of the Board of Oregon Public Broadcasting, and of course, this gives me a great opportunity to thank OPB for their, um, their rebroadcast each week of our Friday Forum at 7 o'clock on Friday evening. Bill attended Willamette University and graduated from the University of Oregon, where he was also student body president. He's been a city club member for 25 years, was on the Board of Governors, and also has served on several research committees. And his wife, Mary Souther Wyatt, who's also in the audience, has been a member of the city club since 1994. Now, Bill, only on, it's Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember which, but uh, returned from a 10-day business trip to China, Korea, and Japan, and I'm pleased, at least with my conversation with him, that he's shown no noticeable signs of jet lag. His staff asserts that this is probably because he resumed his daily runs along the Willamette River the day he returned. Please join me in welcoming Bill Wyatt. Don, thank you very much, and I want to just make a few acknowledgments uh, here for other circumstances. Uh, I have many uh, members of the extended Wyatt family uh, in town, and it's great to, uh, to have them all here, uh, several port employees and two new port commissioners, Paul Rosenbaum and Peter Bragdon, uh, who uh, have just joined the port commission and uh, didn't realize that this wasn't a mandatory obligation of their service to the port. And <laughs> decided to come anyway, so uh, glad to, to have you here. And also uh, my colleague from across the river, Larry Paulson, who's the executive director of the Port of Vancouver, uh, and Larry and I have a great relationship. I think there is a, a, a lot of misnomer that our ports uh, compete uh, hammer and tong on every topic, and the truth is uh, we work together uh, far more often than we uh, compete, so it's great to, uh, Larry, to have you here. Uh, and I was reflecting, knowing that my uh, dad was going to be here today, I was reflecting on <clears throat> uh, the first time I ever came to a city club meeting. It was back in 1974, uh, and it was at the Crystal Ballroom, back where the city club used to meet regularly. And he and Edith Green, uh, of different political persuasions and uh, parties, jointly announced uh, their retirement from Congress uh, together. So. Trading Places, I guess, is a good title for this speech in many, uh, many respects. Uh, it's great to be back here, and I really appreciate having this forum. And to those of you who will be watching later on podcast or listening uh, on radio, uh, hello to you as well. I, I should also say to Don, I think, I don't know if he was uh, introduced to everybody here, he's the Chief Operating Officer of the Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt Law Firm represented by a table over here, and I just want to thank Don for looking after the family franchise, which uh, <laughs> we, greatly, we greatly appreciate. 
Part of what I want to do today is talk about the, uh, the value of having a port in, in our community. And I think Don made reference to something that is uh, important. In Portland, our seaport in particular is uh, not as visible as it is in many other communities. And, and I'm not uh, suggesting that that's a problem. Uh, because in those communities where it is more visible, down in San Pedro Bay and Los Angeles and Long Beach or up in Seattle, uh, that visibility has also been the cause of tremendous uh, conflict, both social and, and environmental. And so there are great advantages uh, in having the seaport uh, kind of out of the way. Uh, but if there is a disadvantage, it is that uh, out of sight, out of mind, and, and many people don't fully appreciate uh, what it has meant to this community uh, over time. And I think it's worth reflecting uh, a bit on the, the value of having uh, this enormous asset here, but also what it's meant to this community and, and how did it happen? Why is it here? So let me just start uh, by saying that there are many things that make this a great place to live, and I get to experience those on a regular basis when I come back uh, to Portland from my many uh, travels. There's just no place that's nicer to come home to, both uh, certainly in terms of the airport, yes, but uh, in terms of the community uh, as, as a whole. It's a fabulous place to, uh, to live. How did that come to be? And I know uh, Chet Orloff is here, and there are some other historians of note in the audience, so I won't go into great uh, specific detail, but I think it is no accident uh, that Portland is where it is, at the confluence of these two great rivers, the Willamette and, uh, and the Columbia. In fact, my own organization was created back in 1891 with the specific purpose in mind of constructing a navigation channel to make navigation from here to the mouth uh, a little simpler. And I think if you uh, imagine many of the cities with which Portland is frequently compared, you come up with names like Austin, for example, uh, Des Moines, believe it or not, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and I, I would say that there are some significant differences between these communities, and they are in many respects noted by the lack of either international air service uh, in many cases, nonstop transcontinental service uh, by these other airports, and certainly none of them have a seaport. And I think uh, it is a significant uh, distinction in terms of our history and our heritage. Now, I think uh, most of you probably know the, the uh, history of Portland's naming. It was a coin flip, two coin flips, actually. Uh, Francis Pettigrove versus Asa Lovejoy, two now street names uh, here in uh, Portland. And Pettigrove won, and so Portland was named after his hometown of Portland, Maine. Now, at the port, we tend to think that we put the port in Portland, certainly. But I think it is uh, just useful to reflect on that name once again, Portland. Both of these communities uh, were thriving uh, ports at the time, uh, Portland, Maine certainly since uh, the 1700s, the late 1700s, and, and Portland, Oregon since the kind of the middle of the 19th uh, century. And <clears throat> the fact that we were a thriving uh, seaport um, really in many respects contributed to so much of the fabric of our community that it's hard to unravel it uh, completely and appreciate uh, how much it's, it's added here. Just 23 years after uh, the famous uh, uh, coin toss, the first international cargoes left the Columbia River on their way to Liverpool, England. It was a, uh, a vessel full of grain. No Panama Canal in those days, so it was around the Horn, uh, which must have been a thrilling ride uh, in a wooden ship. And 139 years later, we continue as a vital gateway for international cargoes, both in and out. Uh, and <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I think the significance of that is as follows. Now first, today, it means a really significant and efficient way to transport people and goods. Now, that is more significant today than it's ever been because we, we hear so much and we talk so much about the global 
economy, but its reality is really easy to appreciate when you begin to think carefully about the things that you do, that you buy, and that you consume every day that are uh, built or manufactured or delivered from some foreign destination. Uh, I, I checked uh, the China today, I looked on the back side, it looks to me like it's uh, manufactured in some foreign uh, country. The, the flatware, I'm quite confident, was manufactured somewhere else. The drapes, uh, probably, I'm sure all of the electronic uh, equipment here uh, today was not manufactured in the United States. It may have been designed here, it may be uh, owned uh, by an American company, but it was probably sourced here, manufactured here, and delivered here. And that is the nature of the global economy. And having these uh, physical assets, this ability to access the world is so very, very um, important. Uh, and it is, if anything, uh, getting to be more important. We are traders uh, by nature here in Portland. Oregon is the, I think, the seventh or eighth most trade uh, dependent state in the United States, uh, and that isn't going to change. Our friends in Washington uh, like to, to describe themselves as the most trade dependent state in the United States, but if you take one company uh, out of Washington, they fall back to about 12 or so. Now, that one company happens to be Boeing, you know, so they get uh, an extra share of uh, credit. But the reason we're traders is because this community was created and founded um, as a result of its access to the then trade ways and trade lanes of the world. And the fabric of our, of our culture and of our business community, as it has evolved over the course of that time, has incorporated trade uh, as a, a very powerful underpinning. And as I, as I had indicated earlier, I think that is so very significant because of the phenomenal uh, growth that we are seeing in trade and because of a fairly basic economic fact. Community wealth is created only if we can produce something or sell something made here created here to someone who's over there, wherever over there is. Because if we're not doing that, we're essentially taking in each other's uh, laundry. And being a trade uh, dependent state and heavily uh, traded sector oriented means that the opportunity to create wealth is greater here than it is in many other parts uh, of the United States. So I think that our location, as realtors would say, location, 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 or geography is uh, destiny, has had a lot to do uh, with the development of uh, the traded sector economy here, and I think it's an enormous asset for, uh, for our community. Ask yourself uh, these questions. Would we have really a Japanese garden here or a Chinese classical garden? Uh, if we didn't have an ever-increasing role in the world of international trade? Would we have nine sister cities from Asia to Europe, Africa, Latin America, uh, to the Middle East? Uh, would uh, Silicon Forest have grown as lush without this access to these uh, vital foreign markets? Would we have a cluster of the top footwear and sports apparel uh, companies in the world, uh, including Nike and Adidas, Columbia Sportswear, Keen Footwear, Lacrosse Footwear, now, but for uh, these enormous uh, assets? And what would the economy of Eastern Oregon look like if, uh, but for the fact that last year we shipped about four million tons of grain out of our port alone, which accounts for about 90% of all of the wheat grown in Eastern Oregon to uh, foreign destinations. Would we have access to two transcontinental railroads uh, or would we just be another abandoned short line? And I think uh, these are very important questions to, uh, to contemplate and, and the conclusion, as you might surmise, that I have drawn is that it is all related to these uh, foundation decisions about where this community would, uh, would be founded, where it would be created, and how it grew uh, to be over time. Now, it's not just big businesses uh, that are involved in international trade. 
The most recent uh, statistics from the International Trade Administration suggest that a total of 4,047 companies exported goods from Oregon to foreign countries uh, in 2005, and of those, 88% were enterprises with fewer than 500 uh, employees. From 2001 to 2006, the value of Oregon exports increased by a whopping 72%. And I think that says a lot for Oregon's uh, businesses, uh, large and small. Now, the port of Portland is certainly not the largest port on the west coast uh, of the United States, although we are in a few categories. Uh, we import more automobiles than anyone else. We export more uh, wheat uh, than, uh, than the others. But uh, certainly as a container port, which tends to be the uh, the topic area that most people uh, focus on. We're not the largest, but nevertheless, the impact of these facilities on our region uh, and on our state is enormous. In fact, uh, the combined activities at our airport facilities and marine terminals employ uh, more than 30,000 people in this region. Every day, 30,000 people get up and go to work at largely family wage jobs uh, as a result of the facilities owned and operated uh, by the Port of Portland. That generates about a billion uh, seven in personal income and about four billion dollars in business revenue. According to William Hudnut uh, III, former mayor of Indianapolis, I might add, a great mayor and a senior resident fellow with the Urban Land Institute, the definition of a successful city is that it is a, quote, a container, the central locus of politics and governance, economic engines and enterprises that create wealth and transportation slash communication networks. It supplies the heartbeat and signature for a region. It is where people gather to live, work, play, learn, and grow. A good city also has a port an airport, or an interstate highway connection. And it's no accident, I would suggest, that the names of former Port Commission chairman now grace so many Portland street signs. Ladd, Banfield, Corbett, I know there's a failing in the room uh, as well, just to name a few, and the new international concourse at PDX is not by accident the Victor Atiyah International Concourse when Governor Atiyah uh, was governor. His nickname was Trader Vic. Uh, he played such a significant role in growing um, our role as an international center of commerce. So international commerce is and has been for some time a, a vital part uh, of our community. So global trade uh, is clearly the driver of the world economy. And I'm not going to suggest to you that all is rosy. Uh, there are many challenges that we as a nation, and I think we as citizens of the world, must confront as it relates to global trade. But its reality in our day-to-day -day life really can't be uh, dismissed. And we are increasingly dependent on the ability of other places to produce things that we want to uh, consume. Never has this network of trade been more uh, sophisticated or uh, complex. I have, uh, and I take whenever I get the opportunity to go visit the factories or operations of locally based companies in foreign countries, and I'm always impressed when I, you know, you go into a Nike shoe factory and you see that they've got two and a half days worth of raw materials on hand for the production. Uh, line to operate, which means that wherever they're getting this stuff from, the rubber, the, the, the cotton, the, the air soles, all of that has to be arriving uh, on, a, on a very sophisticated uh, supply chain, and any interruption obviously means that suddenly their production stops. Well, in the old days, uh, you know, you just constructed big warehouses and put everything up on shelves, and uh, that was fine. Today, that is simply not happening. These, these big shipping containers that you see, those are the warehouses of today. And these products move around the world uh, pretty seamlessly. Uh, and our ability to be successful in that kind of world depends on access to the kinds of facilities uh, that we own and operate. So uh, 
let me shift gears here for a moment and talk about uh, the three subjects that Don mentioned, transportation infrastructure, which is not uh, a sexy topic uh, necessarily, but a very important one, dealing with kind of the basic stuff of roads and bridges, rail, uh, navigation, runways, things that we certainly deal with, and whether you know it or not, you do too. Uh, the environmental issues, uh, things like climate change, for example, the Willamette River Superfund uh, in particular, these are things that have a direct impact on us. You cannot own and operate an international airport and a seaport without having an impact on the environment. And so we have an enormous obligation to address those issues and to reduce the impact that we have on surrounding neighborhoods and on the environment as a whole. And finally, the preservation of land in the Portland Harbor. Uh, now, we own a lot of land at the Port of Portland that we got the old-fashioned way. We made it, you know, with a pipeline dredge. Uh, and that isn't happening anymore. And so the land that we now have in the Portland Harbor is all that we have uh, that is accessible to an international navigation channel. And I want to talk a little bit about the importance of preserving that uh, for future uh, growth. So uh, international trade is expected to rise uh, from its current 25% of the U.S. gross domestic uh, product uh, by uh, 2020 uh, to be about a third. Uh, just to put this in context, in 1970 it was about 13%, so you can see significant and dramatic growth. One of the good news stories in Oregon is that we have a roughly uh, equal balance of trade as a state because we do have um, fairly high value uh, exports and the value of those exports is increasing, uh, which is a very positive uh, story. That is not necessarily the case for the nation as a whole. Exports leaving from, say, Los Angeles tend to be high value products like waste paper uh, and uh, other uh, not so high value uh, products. About one in four jobs in this state is tied in one way or other to international, uh, <clears throat> international trade and projections call for freight volume, uh, just the volume of activity to double in the next 20 years. So that represents a great opportunity certainly but also a tremendous challenge because all of that requires stuff the big toys that we own and operate uh, need related infrastructure, bridges and roads, uh, runways uh, to operate successfully. Uh, interestingly, and I think this is an important point for us as we think about the future, as you know, uh, Northwest Airlines just announced that they'll be beginning a, a new a service from uh, Portland to Amsterdam. Uh, and he was interviewed by the uh, Oregonian editorial board and had a very interesting observation when asked this question, which was, um, what's the, the biggest infrastructure challenge facing airlines today? And I actually expected to hear a little dissertation about air traffic control, which is a big uh, a problem, but he said, no, it's congested airports. Uh, and he said, passengers and airlines are increasingly making decisions about where to go, where to serve, predicated on congestion. Uh, he's got a fleet fully, I think they operate now the largest uh, wide body fleet in the United States. Uh, they can put these planes anywhere, anywhere there's a runway you know, long enough to, to handle them. Uh, and that was a, a big and significant factor in their decision to come here because having access to that infrastructure is so very, very um, important. Now, uh, PDX, I'm, I'm very proud to say, for the second year in a row, uh, was deemed by the readers of Condé Nast Business Travel Magazine to be the best airport in the United States. And I, <laughs> and we, uh, we work very hard on that. I think all of the people who work at the airport, and by the way, that's about 10,000 people who get up every day and go out to PDX and work, which is about 500 people more than live in my old hometown of Astoria, uh, are very mindful of the significant role that this facility uh, plays in our community. We treat it like a piece of the living room furniture, if you will, and that's how people see it. I think people in Portland take the airport uh, very seriously, those who use it in particular. 
but uh, that's a good reason to work so hard at this. But, but more important, um, it's one of the reasons why I believe we've been so successful at attracting uh, both international and now more nonstop domestic service because of the uh, well-functioning of the airport. All of this uh, brings great benefits uh, to, to our community. Now, uh, we've been very aggressive in the last uh, four years, five years, uh, at attracting nonstop international service. And those of you who've used it, I'm sure, appreciate, A, getting up at a civilized hour of the day uh, and not having to get up at 4.30 and, and uh, go through security lines and then end up in San Francisco so that you can fly to, uh, to Europe. Very nice to get up at a civilized hour. It's also very nice to arrive at a civilized hour of the day. Uh, here in Portland, very convenient. But if you're a business traveler and you're making this trip um, once a month, twice a month, perhaps, and I know people who do, the time that you save is absolutely uh, vital. Alan Alley, who is Governor Kitzhaber's uh, chief of, uh, uh, is uh, his economic advisor, told me when he was at Pixelworks making the trip to China once a month, uh, that basically this gave him about two weeks a year of additional time just because of the connects that would have been required without nonstop uh, service. So these services are incredibly important. They provide uh, great cargo access as well for uh, shippers. And we've been fortunate, uh, owing, I think, to a couple of factors. Uh, first, let's be honest, we have a very strong underlying economy which has been extremely uh, helpful uh, when the economy is good, people are flying, and that's a great thing. Owing as well to the commitment of Oregon businesses to use these services, that too is very, very important. Um, airlines are, uh, they love Portland, they like our airport, but uh, they, they have a theory yet to be proven uh, that they're in business to make a profit. Uh, and so if they can't make a buck, they're going to take these planes uh, somewhere else. So having the infrastructure here that can support those services is incredibly uh, important. Now, we're embarking with the partnership, really, at the city, uh, with the city, to uh, renew uh, our master plan and to look at the kind of the long-range future of uh, PDX. In addition, uh, we're looking at a new land use designation for the airport. It currently operates on a conditional use, uh, as though when the conditional use expires, we're going to, you know, lock the gate. Uh, so um, we have some, uh, I think we have some flyers uh, at the back. We'd certainly appreciate your uh, grabbing them on the way out and, and filling them out, giving us uh, your thoughts about this. But this is a vitally important uh, process. It's a multi-million dollar project that will take us easily the next three years uh, to complete, but very, very important for the future of this uh, vital facility. Over the next uh, three years, just thinking about infrastructure at the port alone, we'll be spending about a half a billion dollars on various kinds, types, and shapes of infrastructure at the airport, at the airports, I should say, and at the uh, seaport. Projects include a uh, really sexy thing called a inline baggage screening and detection system. Doesn't sound like much, but it's about 140 million bucks. Uh, and it will take all of those big scanning devices you see in the, in the lobby and move them kind of behind the curtains and underground so that the experience you as a passenger have will be similar to the one you used to have. You grab your bag, you roll up to the ticket counter, you get your boarding pass, you hand them your bag, and you leave. Uh, instead of having to... Hey. Instead of having to schlep your bag back across the lobby, herniate yourself, lifting it onto the machine, and, and I would say back injuries, I think, are still the leading cause of, uh, of uh, uh, illness and sickness and injury among the TSA workers from that very, uh, very activity. So this is a huge project. It's vital for us because the current system uh, will cause us to run out of passenger capacity sometime in the next four or five years. So we need to, uh, to do this. Uh, we need a longer north runway, the runway closest to Vancouver, so that it can handle uh, wide-body aircraft, the kind that fly to Europe, uh, and the freighters that come in here. It's too short for those kinds of aircraft to take off uh, fully uh, laden. We've got to do that because we have to make major improvements uh, and repairs to the south runway 
Well, that's another 60, 70, 80, who knows how many million dollars. It'll be very expensive, very important for us uh, to do. And that's kind of the meat and potatoes of running an airport. Uh, when uh, uh, the previous aviation, or when our previous engineering director retired, uh, he gave a present to the then aviation director, which was a core sample like this of pavement. And he said, I just want you to remember what we do for you. And that's really what running an airport is in large measure all about. It's about paving, repaving, paving, and repaving. And it's probably the, the largest uh, uh, surface area in all of Oregon. I, I was told that the south runway, if, if put in pavement terms, uh, would, uh, would build a two-lane highway between Portland uh, and Salem. So a tremendous volume of pavement out there, very, very uh, important for us and very expensive, frankly. We'll be receiving in May our fourth post-Panamax container crane. Uh, those of you who've seen, the, never seen a container crane but saw the Star Wars movie, The Walkers, you know, that's where George Lucas uh, was inspired, but these are very, very important. They live these enormously heavy steel containers on and off the uh, vessels very efficiently. Uh, we just, on our recent visit, uh, took a look at the construction of this crane. They're delivered upright on a ship, uh, and it'll be another exciting delivery for us, I'm sure. The channel deepening uh, project is well underway. I think the first time I visited the City Club as a port director, there was a great question about whether this project would ever happen. Uh, and I think by the end of this uh, calendar year, we'll be pretty close to 60% complete. We have funding in place uh, to take it to 70% uh, uh, complete. And we, of course, will be back in Washington uh, begging uh, our delegation and others for the balance of that funding so that we can complete it by 2010, which we're confident we can do. Now, all of these investments um, happen only because we have customers who uh, need our services or who we have recruited to use our services and whose fees paid to us cover about 95% of these costs. Every once in a while, we're able to attract a grant here or some public support there, but for the most part, we're a self-funding organization. 97% of the port's revenues, that $260 million annual budget that Don uh, referenced, come from business transactions, landing fees, terminal rents, throughput charges, uh, et cetera. We have a little tiny property tax. I'm not whining, but I dare you to find it on your next statement. Uh, it's small, and uh, we uh, give a great return to this community for that investment. For every dollar that we collect in property taxes, businesses operating on our facilities generate an additional uh, $7.50. So put a buck in, $7.50 comes out. It's a terrific uh, long-term investment. The other thing that we're, we're doing that is not so much infrastructure related, but is very much uh, an important part of our organization, this is uh, the only port on the west coast of the United States that actually operates its own container terminal. All of the other ports are essentially landlords in one form or another. We'd love to be a landlord, but frankly, there was never enough demand uh, to do that. And so we do it all. Uh, and it's, um, it's becoming increasingly evident that it will, it will be difficult for us to compete in a global marketplace operating our own container facility. And so we are beginning the process now of determining whether there is a, a market, an interest, a commercial interest in managing this container terminal. And I can tell you based on my recent uh, trip, I think there is uh, substantial interest. The growth in trade volumes, uh, I think, has put a fear, frankly, into many of the transportation providers about having um, a seat at the table. Uh, it's, a, it's a giant game of musical chairs out there right now in the container world, and if you're not uh, operating a facility of your own at this, uh, at this point in the game, you could wake up one morning and discover that you have no place to land the cargo that you have contracted for. And so I am very, very confident that we will uh, be able to, uh, to make that work. Now there is obviously, obviously a lot of non-trade related infrastructure that's important. And I think the single most important thing this region needs to focus on is rebuilding and reconstructing uh, the Columbia River uh, bridges that cross Hayden Island. There are actually two bridges. 
Uh, and if you look at them, you know, from the top, they look like kind of normal bridges. But if you get underneath, you'll see on the eastmost uh, bridge, a bridge that was built in 1919, uh, which is one Cascadia subduction zone earthquake away from uh, floating. And uh, that would be a tremendous catastrophe for this region. And so uh, we, along with uh, many others, obviously the two state departments of transportation, the governors, and, and so many other public leaders uh, in this state are uh, placing that as our highest uh, public infrastructure uh, uh, priority. It's absolutely uh, vital for us, and we're pleased that the federal government has identified this as an important priority, but it is uh, really, in our view, um, extremely important. I also want to take just a quick moment, and uh, I don't think he's here yet, I want to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Sam Adams, that would be the commissioner and not the beer, uh, for those of you who have been reading the paper. Uh, for really uh, taking kind of a gutsy step uh, at the beginning of his mayoral campaign and advocating fairly substantial uh, transportation funding initiatives. Not a very popular thing in all quarters. And I think he really deserves uh, a pat on the back because uh, we in Oregon have pretty seriously underfunded our transportation infrastructure and it's beginning to show uh, in so many ways. Uh, and I think he uh, really should be acknowledged for, uh, for, this, uh, for this effort. So uh, let me move on now to, uh, to the environment because, as I said, this is a really important subject area for us. We just can't do what we do and not have some impact on the environment or on surrounding neighborhoods, for example, of the, uh, of the airport. For the last several years, we have uh, developed and, and have now implemented something called an environmental management system, which allows us to identify environmental issues that we'll have to confront in advance of having to confront them so that we can build into our development plan strategies for how to cope with those very same issues. Uh, it's kind of boring stuff in some respects, but it's been enormously uh, successful. So we've had to really think about issues like air quality, for example, water quality, which for our facilities is an enormously uh, important subject, water use, energy consumption, uh, and waste generation. And for all of those now, we have very comprehensive uh, strategies that deal with the, uh, those elements of those problems that we have within our control. I can't, for example, redesign the global aircraft fleet, uh, but we certainly operate hundreds of, uh, of vehicles at PDX, many of which now operate on natural gas, for example, or uh, at the seaport on low sulfur diesel so that we reduce the footprint, our carbon footprint, if you will, um, in, this, uh, in this region. Now, uh, the, the subject that uh, uh, I also want to mention briefly, we have decided, the commission has approved, and we're actually under construction now, to rebuild our, uh, a new uh, corporate headquarters for the port at the airport. This is important for a number of reasons. Uh, I would say internally it is very important because we'll save money by doing this. We're going to consolidate virtually all of our uh, workforce into one place. The port historically uh, has been divided into separate uh, areas, so we're very excited about that. Uh, it's going to be a building on the Leeds uh, scale somewhere between gold and platinum, not yet fully uh, resolved, but I think that's very significant because it'll be one of the most visible and important structures that most people see when they come to this state and when they leave the state uh, via air. Uh, and so we're very uh, excited about this. Uh, it'll have no active heating or air conditioning systems. We'll be using a uh, a system of uh, uh, thermal wells uh, to heat and, uh, and exchange for uh, air conditioning. Uh, we won't be connected to the city sewer system. We'll you reuse uh, all of the gray water uh, in the building and uh, it'll be a fabulous workspace as well, but all with an eye towards uh, sustainability. The biggest challenge that we face, I would say environmentally, is relates to the Willamette River and the 
100 plus years of industrial legacy that remain uh, in the sediment. It's an enormous uh, challenge and one that we are uh, helping to play a leadership role in addressing. I'd love to tell you that great progress has been made over the course of the last year, but uh, can't do that. Uh, the, the most significant progress, I think, has been in the expenditure of funds, uh, which continue at an enormous uh, pace. Uh, and I suspect sometime in 2010 or 11, uh, we'll be at a point where the EPA will issue a record of uh, decision. The challenge for us, uh, and I'll just be as blunt and candid about this as I can, uh, is that we don't really have as an organization a, a separate a tool available to us to pay for uh, the legacy of uh, 130 years worth of industrial activity on the port. We have to rely on insurance to the extent that we have it won't get into that topic, uh, and, um, and the willingness and ability of our customers to pay fees that will cover the cost of that. And I can tell you in this very competitive world, no one looks forward to a little line item on their fee that says lower Willamette cleanup. Uh, and so it's an enormous challenge figuring out how we will cover the cost. The other enormous challenge is that because of the nature of this cleanup, in the river, there's a lot of uh, uh, sediment, polluted sediment, that can't really be accounted for. You can't tie it to uh, a single user. Uh, a Superfund site on land uh, is uh, much, much easier to identify. Forensic science uh, isn't as precise as it needs to be to help us uh, identify who actually caused what. So you end up with what's called a very large orphan share. Uh, and the, the Superfund law essentially makes folks like the port, the city, the gas company, and others who have stepped up to, uh, to play a leadership role responsible for that as well. And then it's our job uh, with our great uh, lawyers uh, to go out and find others to help cover that cost. That is an enormous burden on us uh, and on the city in uh, particular. And finally, uh, as you know, and I see Frank Foti here somewhere, good to see you, Frank, uh, one of our very important uh, tenants, customers, uh, now owners of the shipyard. The Portland shipyard remains one of the, the biggest liabilities that we have, and virtually all of the con contamination at the shipyard is owing to uh, the efforts of the Navy in the Second World War. Uh, to uh, equip our soldiers with goods from the Liberty ships which were, were built there. Uh, the Navy these days, unfortunately, is a little hard to find uh, when it comes to paying for their share, which is a significant portion. We are going to work very aggressively with our congressional delegation to see that they step up uh, and play their role. This is not the only site in the United States where that needs to, uh, to happen. And so, uh, I'd say that I'm optimistic because we have to be. The Willamette River is an asset of, uh, of great importance to this community, and uh, I think that we can do this. Now, I would say on a positive note with respect to the Willamette, uh, perhaps the best thing that happened this year was Dr. Pamplin's uh, final uh, donation of uh, at least a significant portion of Ross Island to the city, which will be uh, converted into uh, really, I think, one of the great natural treasures that any city uh, in this country can have. And as it happens, uh, the Port of Portland owns a a uh, small piece of Ross Island, the tip of Ross Island, about two acres. Uh, and I uh, still can't really figure out exactly how we ended up with that. I'm sure there's a great story, but it's ours. Uh, and I'm just here to tell you that we will uh, manage this in a manner that is entirely and exactly consistent with where the city wants to take its stewardship of Ross Island because this asset is too important for our community to, uh, to argue over the uh, details. Now, speaking of islands and industrial land, uh, we own islands. We've created some. We own some. Uh, Government Island was at one time going to be an extension of the airport back in the 60s. That didn't work out, so now we've leased it to the Parks Division, I think. Uh, but we also own the tip of West Hayden Island, uh, or the west tip of Hayden Island, I guess I would say. It's about 800 acres. Uh, it's everything to the west of the Burlington Northern Railroad Bridge. 
Uh, and the port bought this many years ago to develop into essentially marine industrial uh, property. It's right on the navigation channel. And uh, we're intending to proceed with that. Now we know that there are significant environmental values to be protected, uh, and that's very important. But we also know that Metro counts West Hayden Island as a part of the industrial land base of this region. So it's going to be one or it's going to be the other. And if it's not going to be at least a significant portion of it, industrial land, then uh, the, the law uh, governing land use in this state is going to have Metro go out and blow out the urban growth boundary for another four or 500 uh, acres of industrial property. So the idea of balancing these interests of the environment uh, and the uh, need for industrial property on the navigation channel isn't really an option. It's something we have to do, and we are very committed to, uh, to seeing that happen. We're working now with the city to annex uh, West Hayden Island uh, into the city of Portland so that it can be properly served, and we're obviously going to have to work very closely with the island neighbors, with the environmental community, to see that this island can be developed in a manner that is consistent with living in Portland. Uh, let me uh, also just uh, uh, conclude on that topic by saying that uh, later in November our commission will offer for sale or will actually act on the sale of the first parcel of the Reynolds uh, industrial property. Uh, we acquired the old Reynolds aluminum plant out in Troutdale which had closed. They cleaned it up. We're going to buy it. Uh, we have uh, annexed it to the city of Troutdale. It sits adjoining the Troutdale Airport. The first parcel will go to Federal Express. Uh, it's a 75 acre uh, parcel and a state of the art distribution uh, facility. It'll employ about 900 uh, people uh, there. It'll add immense value to the uh, tax base of Troutdale. We're very excited about that. They're very excited about it. And one of the things I just want to make mention of is that it is located, not by accident, uh, adjacent to an interstate freeway because that's where trade-related infrastructure really wants to be. This is a facility, by the way, that is so high-speed, boxes will move through the facility and be in it for typically less than 90 seconds. So it's an enormously sophisticated uh, facility and I think represents a great investment. We'll have about 300 acres left there for other industrial development that I think uh, will be uh, very, very useful. Let me just say one of the great things about this job, and I think I can speak for most of our uh, employees when we get up and go to work today, we get to feel uh, the value that we add because we work with these customers every single day. So we, we help put coffee in your cup, literally, uh, the latest fashions on your feet and the new destinations on your personal travel itinerary. And it's an enormously satisfying feeling uh, to have both a public mission uh, but also to accomplish that by largely uh, private means. So the next time you uh, prepare to hop a flight to Frankfurt or Amsterdam or Tokyo or Boise or Orlando or Boston, uh, be thinking about us at the port. Uh, and uh, it's been a great uh, pleasure for me to speak with you today, and I suspect there will be a few questions, so thank you very much. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club members. Please limit your questions to 30 seconds or less. And our first question today will be asked by our board host, Ron Paul. Ron um, entered the public sector after years as a chef and ref restaurateur. That's when he was the chief of staff for uh, Commissioner Charlie Hales that he started developing his ideas about a year-round public market. Now he is the consulting uh, director for the public market. Ron? Thank you, Bill. And it's always a pleasure to, to hear more about the port and many things that we take for granted. You had almost two footnotes in your uh, remarks that I want to see if they're related and if so, how. You mentioned the master planning process that you're engaging in with the city. And my understanding of that, at least historically, was that it could 
uh, paved the way, literally, for a third runway in the PDX's future. And then you mentioned, on the other hand, uh, that the airport is becoming more and more congested. Now, some people would see a logical connection between those, but I'm wondering if we could decouple them and ask what leadership role is the port playing in congestion pricing? So instead of having the peaks that we could have with the existing infrastructure, a more efficient servicing of more people over time, understanding that Portland is not a major hub and that some of those scheduling issues uh, are driven by a hub and spoke system, but how can Portland uh, with a more forward-thinking transportation ethos help provide leadership in that direction? Well, I think, uh, I guess I would just start by saying at the moment, we don't really experience uh, congestion uh, at the airport. We completed an enormous expansion as in the day before, I think it opened 9-11. Uh, uh, and what's happened since that time is even though we've seen significant passenger growth, we actually have fewer uh, airplanes landing and taking off at PDX today than then. And those of you who fly in, you know why. Uh, there are no empty seats on any planes. You don't fly out of Portland on a half-empty airplane. And so uh, there are more passengers and there are fewer seats. Uh, and that means that we actually have uh, considerable um, <clears throat> opportunity for growth, I think is the optimistic uh, way to put that, additional capacity. Portland has two parallel runways. One of them needs to be extended uh, really just to handle the wide body uh, aircraft. Uh, and then we have what we call a crosswind uh, runway, which is used really very uh, rarely, depending on weather conditions. Having a third parallel runway uh, is way out into the future, and I mean way out into the future. Uh, the position that we've always taken is we need to uh, plan for that, which is to say if we need to acquire land or make certain that we're not developing the airport in such a way that would preclude that development, but my personal view is it's so far out there, it's probably not even responsible to plan uh, significantly for because technology is going to change. You know, uh, I, I'm guessing that uh, two master plans ago, nobody would have imagined the development of something like uh, the Airbus 380, which just took its first commercial flight yesterday, or the Dreamliner, uh, which makes point-to-point -point service from smaller communities possible. Technology is going to change the way airports work in ways that we probably can't imagine uh, today. Now, specifically about congestion pricing, I think uh, in some airports you're going to start seeing congestion pricing where there is real immediate congestion, and the, the one that comes to mind is JFK. They just have too many planes uh, who want to land there, and there isn't a system that the airlines have worked out to cooperatively share the assets. And so uh, I'm guessing that the Port of New York, New Jersey, which owns that airport, is going to have to find a way uh, to do that for them. It is, if you've been following this debate at all, it is highly contentious. Uh, the delegations of New York are, are, you know, hammer and tong with other airports and airlines and uh, hard to say where it will come out, but it's a useful tool. Uh, I think as congestion creeps up, uh, it's certainly a way to contend with that, but it's gonna be a long time before that's a challenge we face here. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member, you mentioned China a couple times in passing, but I wanted to ask you about it. We've got a couple articles here from the Oregonian uh, from this last year. One said that exports from uh, to China increased, I think, 73% in this last year, moving China from number five to the number two trading partner for exports of Oregon, for Oregon. Uh, and there's another article that said, we're not ready. We're not in Oregon. We're not educating people. We don't know the language. We don't know the culture. Partly with your public policy hat on, have you got any comments about how ready we are to take advantage of our access to the Chinese economy? Well, you know, I'm afraid to tell you I could barely hear that. Uh, the sound is really kind of strange up here, so one more time. My, my question is, how ready are we to deal with China and the opportunities we have for China, given they're now our, I think, number two trading export partner of Oregon? Uh, well, that's a pretty good question. Um, I think that 
Oregon is probably better equipped than a lot of places uh, owing to our history of uh, trade in Asia. Uh, not to suggest that all these Asian countries are, uh, are the same. They're not. They're distinctive and, and different. But uh, we've been at it longer, I would say that. <clears throat> um, the Chinese are, you know, I'll be blunt, they're more challenging to deal with in many respects because uh, there are many important systems in that country that are not necessarily transparent. Uh, and so if you are a small exporter, you need help. Uh, you, ne you need really good uh, advice and counsel, uh, and you probably need somebody on the ground in China to, uh, to help you with that. If you're Nike, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you, you've got your own, or if you're Intel, or if you're a big guy. But I think that small uh, exporters uh, need more help than is probably available to them to figure out how to do business over there. It's a... Uh, it's very challenging um, in that, uh, that respect. You know, think about it this way. They're doing in about 15 years what we've had about 15 decades uh, to do. So all these things we're hearing about, the, uh, the lead paint, the, uh, the food supply, the safety issues, they're real to be sure, but they were real here too. Uh, you know, we were not exactly immune from that kind of history in this country. They just don't have the time for it. So. Uh, or they haven't had the time to develop. But I think uh, more help is very important for small exporters. I'm sorry we're out of time for additional questions. Bill, we always enjoy your appearances at the City Club, and we look forward to hearing you again. We're adjourned.